Right. Well, I think that means we're starting. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us, um, if you're here with us today. Um, I'm Kate Maltby. I am the Deputy Chair of Index on Censorship. I'm also a theatre writer and Chair of the Critics Circle Drama Section London, which means I'm particularly excited and um, enthusiastic about our new magazine, which we're launching with this event, um, which is themed entirely around theatre and the role that theatre plays in dissent. Um, and to help me launch that magazine, I have two fantastic um, speakers with me. We're going to be talking about um, censorship and theatre, particularly in the Turkish, in the context of Turkey, um, in the, a context of increasing threats against free expression. Writers and artists are continuing to find ways to tell their stories on stage. But what does the Turkish context teach us? as we face these challenges around the world? And how is theater resisting oppressors in Turkey specifically? Now, I'm going to start by introducing our speakers and by um, beginning a conversation with them. I'll introduce some questions, but I'd also very much welcome some questions from the floor, which you can submit in the chat or through the Q&A function. Um, and towards the end of the hour, I will also be inviting the speakers to read from their own work for us please be aware that this event is recorded and a full recording of the event will be available on our Facebook page. So um, over to our speakers. So um, Kaya Gench is a long-term friend of Index on Censorship. He is the contributing editor. He is a contributing editor for us based in Istanbul. Uh, Kaya is a novelist and a journalist whose work has been published in the New York Times, the Paris Review, the London Review of Books, and pretty much everywhere else worth reading. Um, he has a PhD in English literature, and his first novel, L'Aventura, Macera, was published in 2008. His latest book is The Lion and the Nightingale, which I think we're going to be hearing a bit from later on, which tells the story of his extraordinary quest to find the places and people in whom the contrasts of Turkey's rich past meet. And with him today, we have Meltem Arakan, who is a Turkish and Welsh author. It is an absolute huge honor for us to have Meltem here. And I'm also particularly excited because I've just found out that this is the first time that she and Kaya, the two giants of the scene, have met properly. Um, so we are going to be facilitating a conversation between them for the first time. Um, Meltem Arakan is known for her sharp critique of society and the fearless and outspoken voice in her novels, plays, poems, and articles. She has written 11 books, including nine novels, and she's also written five plays. Her fourth novel, Yeta Tenemi Atimayin, Stop Hurting My Flesh, was banned in early 2004 by the Committee to Protect Minors from Obscene Publications. You may well have heard about this, and if not, go and read it up. It's a very important cause. The ban was eventually lifted, and Arakan was awarded with, freedom of, with the Freedom of Thought and Speech Award in 2004 by the Turkish Publishers Association. Um, she has received several awards and was shortlisted for the Freedom of Expression Award in 2014 by Index Us um, for her play Miminal, which the Turkish authorities claimed was a rehearsal for the Gezi Park demonstrations in 2013. Their subsequent hate campaign, fueled by state-sponsored media, forced her to leave Turkey, and she now lives in Wales. In 2019, the a Turkish court accepted an indictment seeking life sentences for 16 people, including her. So this is someone who's really experienced um, harassment and you know, serious violent threats by the state at the very hard end of the of issues of censorship and dissent. So um, we are incredibly grateful and glad that she's able to be here today. Um, I am going to start off by asking some general questions, but then I would love to have some questions from the floor. And um, before as I introduce the questions, Kaya and Meltem, if there's anything else you want to say to introduce yourself or something you just think is really important to get out there straight away, feel free to, to chime in. Um, but I think I want to start with asking you both about the articles that you've written for this edition of Index on Censorship for the magazine, because that's what we're here to launch and that's what we're here to celebrate. Um, Meltem, your article discusses your experiences with the play Mimimo, which we've just talked about. Um, and I wondered um, if you could just 
talk, summarize that a bit for us, talk a bit about the play. For those of us who haven't followed the full story um, of the attempts to shut it down, um, if you could just fill in that background from your own perspective. Okay, it's the Me Minor is the uh, absurd play and it was the kind of a play in the world first time stage. Because what I did, I created a um, country and in the stage you follow real theater play, but the, at the same time, we have RPG in the social media. So it, it is a two layer. When you come theater, you don't come to theater, you come our uh, country in the police they can um, search you like an airport and then you join the country and in the country we have television um, uh, you can see what is going on in the news we have a president play so it's, it's a proper uh, small country things and then when you see what is going on in the street you can see in the television too at the same time but what uh, is all going on? At the same time, we have digital player, we call them digital player, stay in the table. Think about, for example, I'm sure people just um, remember Arab Spring or Occupy, what happened there? Just uh, people do you stream and then tweet and then talk about we did the same time. In our uh, play, you come with your um, telephone, even computer, everything is free. And then one of our actresses do you stream all the time in English. So uh, people able to watch all around the world, not only uh, in Turkey. And then they join with, um, with the social media. So it's, it's a, a layer in layer play. And uh, when I just did it, uh, people just said, oh, nobody can understand. But I said, um, young generation will understand because we, didn't understand young generation is change. The, uh, now we are a transition time for the analog to digital. And I just follow it a lot before I wrote this play. So, and I was right. The young people enjoy a lot. And then they came again and again and again. Um, it's kind and of- you're Sparking online conversations, presumably. They take the digital stream and they continue that into their ongoing social media yeah, and life. You know, is sometimes they come and support president. Sometimes they uh, come and support rebellion. Uh, sometimes they join uh, only from social media. So it's give a lot of different tools and it's really, you join the play. Um, but if you don't want to join, again, we have a space for who want only uh, want to watch. So uh, some people just come and only watch, but a lot of people, you join us and it, it was it was so interesting first people didn't understand um but then they just get used to it because of you stream because of social media and it's interesting we became one time in a tt in twitter all around the world and uh, we became three time tt in in turkey so it's so how people uh, really mm. uh, enjoy with it and how much physical space did that take up? I mean, you said you were creating the the, the um, idea of people Thank having you. to walk Thank into you. or through a security border. No, it's we need really big play. So we just play it in in, um, in the basketball place. So, and even it's a little bit uh, small, but uh, we handle it. Yeah, we need really big, big space for everything because then you experience everything like a proper um, country. <laughs> And can you talk us through the political response to that? Um, when I just, actually, when I just wrote it, I really honestly did everything not associate Turkey because I was not interested in Turkey because I follow all WikiLeaks, what is going on and the anonymous movement. I was part of them. I start write article, um, write article uh, about um, digital world. And so I never, think I'm just criticize Turkey, okay. Um, but uh, when people just start watching, people said, oh, you are so courageous. You just go to Silivri. Silivri is in, in Turkey in, in the prison. And, and I couldn't understand why people just say, I just go to Silivri, it's an absolute play. And, <laughs> uh, but um, it's interesting what I said after my play um, stage, 
And then what I wrote in play, 99% became real. So why people called me Nostradamus, but how can I be responsible <laughs> to write beforehand what, what happened in Turkey? And even one day I said, maybe I should create a case for Turkish government because they follow my script. And I just wrote uh, beforehand. Um, so really well, everything what happened after. One of the things that I've been thinking a lot as we all put this magazine together, as we all think about theatre and dissent, is theatre's power to bring people together in new spaces and to create that kind of unique moment where there are a bunch of people who might never have met before but are suddenly physically inhabiting the same space. Or possibly if it's a digital me digital theatre add-on, in, uh, um, they're inhabiting the same kind of social media landscape. Because one of the piece, uh, there's another piece in the magazine which I've written, which is um, I was very lucky to interview Bel Belarus Free Theatre, um, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, who have been staging performances um, at great personal risk for many years in uh, Lukashenko's Belarus. But one of the things that really um, comes out to me about the relationship between theatre and protest for them is that people really aren't supposed to gather. Um, increasingly COVID has been used as an excuse to um, prevent people from gathering in Belarus, despite the fact that the official government line is there is no COVID in Belarus, because it's a perfect country. We've run it all perfectly. We have a perfect health system, so we have no uh, COVID. But on the other hand, you can't, you can't meet up because of COVID. But it's actually always been the case that gatherings of people coming together have been very tightly monitored as they are in all kinds of secret police societies. And yet the excuse of a play, whether it's legal or not, becomes a moment where people come together and they start thinking and they start getting excited and exhilarated. And whether or not the play itself is actually a, um, I mean, I think what a lot of the people who I spoke to for the Belarus Free Theatre piece said to me was that often the play itself is not subversive, except that it brings people together who are not supposed to acknowledge community with each other and it discusses problems of the human soul and problems of the human experience um, that are unacceptable often in a society that claims to be perfect. It's not necessarily a critique of the government to acknowledge that, for example, mental health problems exist or that divorce exists or that infidelity exists. Because if you have a perfect society and in particular countries that espouse strong family values, the acknowledgement of that is in itself a critique of the government. But Kaya, um, I wondered, sorry, I've gone off on my own tangent slightly, but I've been meaning to bring it back to you and ask you um, for your response uh, to Melton's experience, because I know you've written about this and you've explored um, issues of censorship and theatre in Turkey for a very long time. And I wondered what you were thinking as you were listening both to that and to my comments about BFT in Belarus. Yeah, when uh, Meltem's uh, play, Mi Minor, um, debuted, um, Turkish, the, the theater scene in Turkey was flourishing. It was a very interesting time for theater in Istanbul, particularly. So in car washes, laundries, uh, photography studios, car repair shops, uh, in where I live in Istanbul, Para, this uh, neighborhood, you would see small theater companies. And we had the sense that, you know, the theater scene is flourishing politically, everything can be expressed. But uh, now that I look at it from, um, the, 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 the vintage point of today, I can see that most of the plays were not about contemporary Turkey. Uh, there were plays about, for example, some Kurdish plays about uh, torture in Turkish prisons in 1980s. Or there were plays about 1930s and what happened to Kurds in those years. And then uh, there were mostly historic, uh, historically, historic content in these political plays. And, Somehow, I think, uh, perhaps provocatively, the, for the government, this was okay because the government said, you know, we are bringing to you the new Turkey. And before us, everything was bad, but now everything is okay. And we are giving you this perfect freedom to express whatever you like. So when we were watching all these plays about historic injustices, we were, th we were having the illusion that everything was free, but when Miminor debuted and they said, okay, now let's look at today's Turkey and what's going on here. Then everyone was suddenly, no, no, you can't say that. You can't say that, you know, just 
Talk about the mm. past. Talk about the military coup in 1980 or the military coup in 1971. Uh, so uh, this is one thing I find interesting. The other thing is uh, the uh, the incredible popularity of In Your Face uh, theater, the drama genre in Turkey. Why was Mark Ravenhill, Sarah Kane, David Ives, uh, all these uh, all these playwrights so popular in Turkey? So I think. Um, uh, the, the the journalist I interviewed in my piece says, you know, after a while we were bored with uh, Mark and uh, Jane's problems. We wanted to see Turkey, pe- the problems of people living in Turkey. Uh, and mm. I think people felt that they were being very modern and, you know, contemporary when, we're, when, when they were watching these Turkish adaptations of these in-your-face plays. But it also, I think, uh, blindfolded us. Uh, to our to what was going on in Turkey, so uh, that that I find very interesting. And then, um, of, and then there is the uh, the the problem of scale. All these uh, car washes, all these uh, little places that we had these uh, theater plays, uh, they were very intimate, small spaces, and there people felt free, but also it was very private. You know, the public um, aspect of because Turkish theater had this incredible uh, tradition of epic political plays. These small places, I think, cut off these wings of epic theater, political theater in Turkey. And in the intimacy of these small places, okay, we like uh, seeing uh, all these uh, abuse characters articulating their problems and we Mm -hmm. had this sense of connection with them. But at the same time, we were again missing out on the more political, the bigger problems uh, of society. And when Miminer staged those problems on, on such grand scale, people were scandalized a bit and were also very amused at the same time. So it was, I think, uh, the idea behind it, you know, the, the idea, the, the, the ambition behind it, that was so shocking. And that was also so anti uh, that, that it was so counter to the mood of the moment because everyone was saying, let's focus on the politics of the private, let's focus on historic injustices, and you know, let's focus on these things. And this was like yes. uh, a wake up call. And I, I find that very interesting in the Belarusian context as well, because obviously Belarus is a, is a much more strictly controlled society than Turkey. You know, they can't be compared in terms of the extreme forms of um, state surveillance. But Sarah, Sarah Kane um, provided uh, Be- one of Belarus Free Theatre's most important early hits. I and mean, there was a production of 4.48 Psychosis. And I think the first time they did it was 2005, but they've, they've kept on doing it. Um, Partly, of course, you talk about the difference between the politics of the private and the politics of the public. I think Belarus is a situation where the politics of the public, even approaching that is just death. I mean, you can't you can't even go anywhere near that. Whereas, it, I mean, it, is, it may be increasingly, as Meltem has experienced, heading that way in Turkey, But and you are the experts. Um, but I find it really striking that it's those in-your-face theatre plays that for many people who began to get involved in Belarus Free Theatre, and they've all, they talk to me about this a lot, and it's, it's in my piece of the magazine, those were plays that shocked them because they acknowledged, you know, there was one person who said to me, I'd never seen a play that, it, that acknowledged that people could be depressed because the only time I'd ever seen plays were these sort of big state, state official kind of opera productions about our great no- noble patriotic history and how happy everybody was. And that's clearly a stage, isn't it, that nations can go through with theatre. Um, I find it interesting, as you say, that Turkey is now at a different stage in many ways. But um, Meltem, I wanted to ask you a bit, just a bit more about the reaction and, and in particular, how um, your your experience at the hands of the Turkish government and the experience of, of exile, uh, the experience of being indicted on a death sentence, how has that changed your writing? You said you weren't kind of expecting this when it will happen to you. Well, now it's happened. What does that mean for you as a writer? Um, actually, you know, it's everything starts uh, with this government in 2004 for me when they banned my book. 
which Kaya said people just believe the government really support freedom of speech and and everything gonna be all right. But in 2004, when they banned my book, I just really did everything to explain people they are telling a lie. Okay, and a lot of people think I'm exaggerating. But today I can easily say, because back then I didn't know, but now I know I'm autistic. Autistic means you can follow pattern better than neurotypical people. So why I can see more clearly what is coming or what is going on. So this Turkish government never ever be genuine and uh, just they always tell a lot of lie. And when my book censored, you know, um, I did a lot of protest and nobody joined me and nobody just give a voice. And I just get banned more and more from newspaper and television. Uh, be before uh, they banned my book, I was very, um, let's say, um, not famous, but people just love watch me in television. So I invite a lot of television program because I am the only one talk about a uh, woman very openly. Um, so uh, it start 2004 and you know, government never ever uh, be, um, you just say uh, it's Belarus really different, but my experience in Turkey, uh, it's very similar to them. I never feel I'm just so um, free what I'm writing or what I'm saying uh, in Turkey because I always have a problem uh, with the government. And, and it's interesting when me minor stage, uh, because I told people able to watch uh, via Ustream, for example, uh, two people came from USA just only to watch in real um, what is happening. And then when they watch, they say, oh, it's very similar in USA. One people came from Egypt after watch Ustream. Mm -hmm. And then he said, oh my God, it's Egypt. So what I think, just when people watch from Ustream, they really want to experience. And a lot of um, different countries, people just came only watch me minor. And all of them say, oh, it's our country. So I think we just all have very similar uh, problem all around the world, not just Turkey. But what I experienced when, um, before everything, after Gezi Park, in the biggest newspaper put us the uh, headline and said, what a coincidence. Is everything start like that? Even it start, you know, I think I'm just a little bit um, gullible uh, because I say, okay, maybe police will come. So I prepare my book and then people say, what are you doing? And I say, when I just go to police, I just read people just laughing. I, they just say, you I just, you think it's like this? Um, I thought maybe they only take us and uh, ask a question, but it doesn't work like that. Uh, it's the worst thing what I experience. First of all, really every minute I take a, a death threat or rape threat. And if you have woman, things get more dirty, you know? It's just everything start, um, they just use a language all about uh, your, your gender, let's say. Uh, and it was horrible. And then after a while, when mayor of Ankara uh, had um, do television program every week, five hours, six hours, only about me minor, then uh, people just think, um, I um, um, just betrayed my country. And, and around where I live, uh, even people just turn their head. Just, and it is so weird to understand what is going on for me. And, and the most awful things to see um, my son eyes to fear because um, he just always fear, just think one day the police will come or someone uh, will do something. And one day um, I really leave three months in my home to go, uh, not go out. Uh, we have bodyguard uh, because it's just um, all trade getting really worse. Only one day I should go to bank and it's 10 minutes and it's not in the city. And then I saw in my car, you, you dead or you already dead is kind of writing. And everywhere is camera. We just go to police, mm -hmm. of course they couldn't find anything. And it was, I think, uh, true. And I, I remember my nervous system is broken, and 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 um, it's hard to say explain all what I have been through. But um, 
I really give up from Turkey, you know. I just say, okay, I just don't want to hear anything. I don't want to do anything. And I'm just a little bit uh, angry for the people who believe government beforehand and who support. I really just very angry to that people. I'm sorry, Kaya, but just I feel love no. because of you guys. It's happened. Nobody believe me. It's kind of a, um, it's kind of a. Well, it's a, interesting. It's interesting that you talk about threats as a woman, because we have one question from Bernadine specifically asking about your experiences as a female writer in Turkey and also in Wales. And someone else asking, you know, what your experience of moving to Wales has been like and, you know, how exile has affected you in that way. Um, when I just, um, I'll explain. First of all, um, in Wales, I am, I feel I am my home. I found my home. So uh, as I'm just so grateful to Turkish government just push me this way, really. Now I'm just saying every day, thank you. Um, because I'm so happy in here. And how it's affect me, it's affect me first. Um, first, I just try to give up writing, but uh, it's nothing happened. So I start writing in here. And when I came here, I did a theater play called um, Enough is Enough. And this time oh, yeah. I did, I researched all women abuse issue in, in UK. And then uh, it's again, um, very uh, strong and uh, in your face piece is a geek theater and all the story is um, real. I did very similar in Turkey and, uh, and then just uh, people banned first the book and then theater play, people just really don't like. Um, but in here it's so different. Only um, stage give four star. It was my first uh, play uh, in the UK. But a lot of audience said I am so courageous because it's too much in people's face for Britain. <laughs> in, in here, people just use more um, different, they, they use language different. But it was so, but you know what happened? Everybody say, thank you. Thank you, you just did like this. Thank you, you are so open. So I think it's very different for me to see um, the difference um, attitude. Um, yes. And the other things now, and then I wrote another play. This, the, the, the second one, in the, again, in the first play in the world, uh, two people represent me. One of part is writer Maltam who live in Turkey. Another one who live in Wales and how change. So they speak each other in the play. And one of them speak Welsh, one of them speak uh, Turkish. When I well, I'm glad you're, you're still writing. Can I, is it okay if I bring in Kaya? Because yeah, um, yeah. I think we're going to run out of time on this section okay. quite soon. And in a minute, Kaya, I'm gonna ask you to talk about The Lion and the Nightingale before you read from it, which is your latest book. But before, as we're wrapping up this section of the Q&A, I really just wanted to bring you back in to see if there was, you know, I know that you've studied um, fascism and dissent and authoritarianism and nationalism all throughout your career. And I just wondered if there was a bit more that you wanted to say on the broader themes we've touched on about whether or not theatre actually is um, a powerful locus for dissent. Because of course, the question people always ask is, well, does it change anything? Does art ever change anything? Isn't art, is art just a distraction from politics? What is your response to those questions in the context of what we've been talking about? Yes, I, let me introduce a note of optimism. Uh, and the the mayor of Ankara that Melta mentioned, who uh, who who mentioned her uh, in his weekly programs, is now out of office, and there's an opposition mayor in Ankara, and also the mayor of Istanbul has been toppled, and now there's a young uh, progressive mayor whose first act was to uh, give the job of uh, city theatre director to Mehmet Ergen from Arkola Theatre in London, uh, which really introduced a sea change in Turkey. Uh, so these things uh, change, uh, I think, dramatically in this country. And um, so I was reflecting on this when I was writing my uh, new uh, index piece, because I went to the Atatürk Cultural Center, which is at the heart of Taksim and where the uh, Gezi protests began. And at the, at the moment, 
that building was uh, was being renovated was about to be demolished and then it was announced it would be demolished now they reopened it um, and it's a state theater so ankara will decide you know whose plays will be uh, staged there and apparently the turkish translator of the protocols of the elders of zion uh, this uh, this this theater this playwrights um, uh, play will be uh, will, will will debut there uh, this month, which is very sad and which is very strange because you know Istanbul votes for the opposition for the progressive values, and maybe you know people would prefer to see uh, Mimi Nur in Akeme, but Ankara says no, we want you to stage uh, something by the author by the translator of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and so this is there's this incredible culture clash, this culture war is uh, getting. Um, I think more intense in Turkey, and there are things we don't mention. You know, we, you mentioned the fascism, a history of message fascism. So we don't, for example, mention the word anti-Semitism in Turkey. We don't identify it, and everyone calls each other fascist in Turkey. Uh, the left is called the right is fascist, and right is also do it to the left. Uh, but we have to, you know, give it a name. So this is what this is one of the problems, but uh, there is also, I think, uh, cause for optimism. Uh, for example, there is a new Netflix production in Turkey called The Club, and which is about uh, the Jewish experience in Istanbul in the 1950s and 40s and 50s, uh, and it's, it's Netflix's the biggest offering for this season, and people show incredible. A curiosity in this subject and people are wondering why do, why didn't we hear about this so there is this i think uh, great interest in uh, broader issues uh, political historic and cultural issues uh, that miminer uh, you know, tried to tried to uh, ponder um, almost a decade yeah. ago and th this kind of um, this kind of analysis is what is needed in Turkey. Let, let's uh, let's uh, discuss anti-Semitism in Turkish culture. Let's discuss um, all these uh, subjects we we prefer uh, to be we, we prefer to be muted about. So I think it's incredibly important that people like Meltem are so these are so very outspoken uh, uh, people can uh, come from Turkey, but also can return to Turkey. You know, the, the, the problem is most of the intellectuals in Turkey who, who bring these issues to the fore uh, are uh, forced to uh, exile. And this is this is the tragedy of Turkey. But there is also this counter uh, force that I think we should consider, which uh, can give us some optimism. Well, thank you for that. Um, as I said, um, we wanted to move on in the second half of this session to hearing you both read from your from your own work. So Kaya, since we've been with you, I, I think this is a perfect time for you to, ex to talk a bit about the line in the unicorn, no, sorry, the line in the nightingale, which um, I know you were going to read from us, but also if you'd like to introduce, uh, introduce it and explain in any way how this ties into the themes that you've just been discussing, be my guest. Yes, yes. So my, my book is a, is a kind of journal of the plague year for Turkey and the year is 2017, which was I think one of the one of the harshest years of Turkish history. Um, this is the year after 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 the coup attempt, and this is the year uh, that began with a terrorist attack in a nightclub, and this is the year where most where you know numberless people were uh, detained, imprisoned, uh, and forced to exile, and so I wanted to tell the story of this year from the perspective of 12 different people uh, in 12 different parts of the country. And let's see, see what, what they've experienced from their shoes. Let's, let's be in their shoes and let's see what they've gone through. And let's not just look at uh, the culture people in Istanbul or the political people in Ankara, but let's look at uh, cleaning ladies. Let's look at, let's look at uh, local journalists in little towns. Um, and so I, I tried to uh, introduce as many points of view as possible into this narrative and try to view it in such a way that gives a kind of more total sense of uh, what 
called the new Turkey and the kind of the selfishness of the new Turkey and how it, uh, how it forces us to our own points of view. And, and so this is part of the point that I made earlier. You know, we are forced to just uh, focus on the individual point of view, which is of course very important, but um, I think it also give, gave, gave uh, people in Turkey uh, an overwhelming sense of uh, egotism and a kind of selfishness, which um, uh, when we see people in suffering, for example, because of their ideas or because of their actions, you know, the first instinct is to preserve ourselves, you know, because if we speak out, then something bad will happen to us. And this <clears throat> kind of uh, self um, regard, uh, which combined with self censorship, is now inscribed in the, most of people. So I'll read from this book from the opening uh, from the opening pages, uh, which from the introduction. Months before it began, 2017 promised to be a sorrowful year for Turkey. Most of us drew little hope from the new year. In the preceding months. The country had turned into a land of calamity, and we were used to living in a state of anxiety. Bombs, repression, and political instability had become everyday news. We had gone through a season of disappointment, humiliation, and tragedy, both public and private. Why would 2017 be any different? Turkey could make pessimists of us all, but rarely on this scale. Never before had the country appeared this precarious, its political fe feature hanging so strongly in the balance. The year was yet a blank page, but a glance at it filled one with angst. In the first week of December 2016, the BBC asked me to come over to their Istanbul studios to record an interview concerning my predictions for the upcoming year. The offices of the broadcaster had moved from the city's elite Nishantasha neighborhood to Gümüşsuyu, the urban district in the northern European side of Istanbul, where the writer James Baldwin had lived in the 1960s. The new BBC offices were located on the top floor of a building named after Mitat, an Ottoman Pasha responsible for modernizing the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century who was assassinated in a prison cell after being charged with the murder of Sultan Abdulaziz. On the day of the interview, I woke up at 6.30 a.m. A London journalist on his night shift would conduct a talk. There is a three hour difference between British and Turkish time zones. It would be the day's last assignment for him and its first for me. A young staffer opened the door he looked sleepy. A cold wind blew outside. The rain had an icy quality. The sidewalks were frozen. In a building nearby, the curator duo, Michael M. Green and Ingar Dragset, were announcing the conceptual framework for the 2017 biennial, A Good Neighbor, to a group of journalists whose tweets I read while waiting. The staffer offered to brew coffee. As he did that, I walked to the other end of the BBC office. I entered a room that offered commanding views of Doma Bace, the most exquisite of Ottoman palaces, as well as Vodafone Arena, the recently opened stadium of Peshiktaş, a major Istanbul football club. Thick black curtains hung on the walls. I realized this was a fully equipped television studio. Walking past large cameras that waited in a state of hibernation, I imagined BBC correspondents filling the room in the upcoming months. From there, they would report on Turkey, a country that represents, for many British people, a holiday destination before anything else. Would this new studio bring cheerful news to the British taxpayer? To their eyes, did Turkey still seem like a safe country where they could take refuge during rainy London days? In the following months, I would meet many of them in England during book tours, and I would remember this moment. There was one constant about 2017, the constitutional referendum in April. 
people would be asked if they agreed to change Turkey from a parliamentary democracy to a presidential system, an alarming prospect for liberals concerned with Turkish democracy. During the interview, I talked about the legal deliberations that awaited the nation. The new system was pushed by the current president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The majority of the Turkish political leaders opposed it. I told the interviewer about my fears for a new wave of terror attacks. In the recent months, both the so-called Islamic State and the Kurdistan Workers' Party had vowed to destroy Erdogan's Turkey. On December 10, 2016, a week after the BBC interview, in a Western Istanbul neighborhood called Bajlar, a suicide bomber put on an explosive vest. He was assisted by a headscarf woman who drove a Chevrolet Aveo car loaded with 40, 400 kilograms of TNT explosives. They headed to Vodafone Arena. The stadium <clears throat> seen from the BBC offices the double suicide attack resulted in the deaths of 44. 166 people were injured. Kurdistan Freedom Falcons, an offshoot of the PKK, claimed responsibility for the attacks. On the night of the violence, I watched the news alongside a journalist friend. He wondered if the government should declare martial law. Since the week of the attempted coup on 15th of July, 2016, we had been living under a state of emergency. There were frequent power blackouts. A few days every week, we dined by candlelight. Many had become used to the state of emergency. In private conversations, friends were telling me they supported it. For in those dark times, it appeared to take to them to make the city safer. But the state of emergency curtailed individual freedoms and martial law was an even harsher measure. They will need to announce curfews, my friend predicted ominously. Kurds are attacking them. The jihadists are attacking, attacking them. People like us, the young Turks are silent, but that can also change. At the moment, the government can't rule the country. Listening to him, I realized how much I dreaded the coming of the new year. That sense of dread was new to me. I had been living in Istanbul for 35 years. During that time, I had not seriously considered whether I should keep on living in this city. But that December evening, it was this question I was pondering. Maybe it was time to leave. In 2016, I felt I was midway upon the journey of life. I hoped to spend the rest of it in a country whose future I could more or less predict. I was not married. There were no kids in the house, no job at an office. I felt ruthless and free, but also increasingly precarious. Since the first years of the 2000s, I had been a nightingale in Istanbul. Here I experienced many of the pleasures of youth. I met my first love here. I published my first story here. I had established myself in the eyes of family and acquaintances as a writer. Most friends got married in their late 20s. I attended their weddings with different partners. Now in 2016, they were preparing to send their children to school. It was not easy for them to live elsewhere because of their roots. I felt different. I was single. I could leave whenever I wanted. I did not need to live in Turkey to see what 2017 would bring. But despite the dangers and the common feeling of pessimism, I chose to stay. Writing became an excuse for this decision. It soon turned into a moral responsibility. Thank you very much, Kaya. Melton, um, if you'd like to introduce your work, um, I think I'm happy for you to really to say whatever you'd like to say about it and then go straight on to the reading. Okay, now I'm the first time uh, reading Me Minor uh, after all these things happened. So I read a little bit about my uh, Me Minor first, and then I read a little bit my latest play, Ye Brain Kargalar. So, and first I'm reading from Me Minor, Anchorman. Good day and welcome. We'd like to share with you the 
highly important declaration that was given from the presidential president today. According to the declaration, our president hasn't slept for 48 hours and he listened to the phones of people whom he randomly chose. The president declares that this shall be done by him once a week. In his declaration, he underlined that in every country, the phones are being listened to. However, they do it behind closed doors. It's never announced to the public whose, whose phones are listened to. Whereas in our country, what the president is doing in the name of democracy and transparency should be set as an example to the whole world. This method will make it easier to find the citizen who are adopted by the aliens and they will be treated immediately. President, my people, I couldn't wake up this morning because I didn't sleep last night. I didn't sleep because I fought for you, for your happiness, so I made a decision. Many choices are not freedom. Mind confused when choices increase. Choices lead to polarizations, polarizations to hostile, hostility. Therefore, I have decided that only two parties will participate in the election. I am the presidential candidate for both parties. Public voice is very important in democracies. That's why I decided to have two parties. Even though you don't speak, I hear you, my people. Furthermore, ballot boxes, computers, and offices being used during the elections will all be history. On the election day, there will be a 500 meters long running race in the stadium between the two parties, and the party who wins the race will come to power. The run means to be resistance while going forward. For now on, the elections will not go to waste. On the contrary, it will be an actual race that you will all participate in with, in with enthusiasm. So this is the part of me minor, how the president was act there. So, and this is the brain, my um, Turkish and Vash uh, piece. And again, it's reading in English first time. Um, the past, I need to breathe. Achievements, applause, awards. The mansion we live in with swimming pools, maids. I had everything, but something was always missing. My soul was always in pieces. Writing saved me from going mad. But all this happened because of my writing. I was banned, defamed, slandered. Before I came here, I lived with bodyguards and security cameras in the house. People would think I was ex exaggerating if I wrote about my life. Ah, uh, squirrels! Keep appearing, squirrels! Another one! I don't want to go shopping today. Screams throw me. Why is the love I have so hard to understand? Love to become aggressive, alienated. Suppressing love as I became more alienated. Afraid of my capacity to love. Can one be afraid of their capacity to love? The more I suppress, I couldn't visit my geese. Maybe I swam with my dolphins. I am in pieces. Van, Ankara, Didim, Silivri, Küçükkuyu, Istanbul. Images jumping around in my mind, rebellious, disappointed, quiet, naughty, headstrong, stubborn, piece of me. Have I forgotten? I miss eating toffee apples. I bought my first pair of Converse trainers while we were rehearsing for me, Mina. I wanted to pay so much when I was a teenager to be like everyone else. Envy, accepting. I thought, crow flees in flocks. But now I keep seeing them alone, circling me. Remember, crows and raven bring news of new beginnings. They tell us that change is needed in our lives. Remember my wildness, your stillness, your withdrawal, our ferocity, my colorful nature, your serenity, my music, 
copy of poems, our lust, our believing love, my solitude, our solitude. Step by step in veils, our wordless history towards ourselves, not fearing being shattered. From pieces to wholeness, do not be afraid, you will remember. At times, against your will, waterfalls stream inside you. You don't know a way to stop it because you are not used to it. At times, against your will, a warm feeling surrounds your heart. You don't know how to cool it because you are not used to it. At times, against your will, the voice of nature reach into your hidden depths that you have held back, leaves you petrified. You can't stop your tears from falling because you are petrified. At times, against your will, life push you to, so that you can give birth to yourself. You'll remember everything when you free yourself from the layers of numbness you have buried yourself in. You true self, you. Life be different when you start singing no matter where you are, when you begin to connect with your womanhood, when you begin tracing the unwritten history of woman that's hidden inside you, you'll begin to see things that are invisible to the eye when you begin to remember. I hadn't thought about my books for so long, my books that lined the walls, there were so many that I couldn't carry them. I thought books would be the hardest things to live they were the first thing I had to leave. It was like pulling skin from skin, but I did it. Once it's done, I want to let go of everything. When I was a child, I thought I was an alien. I fell asleep in front of open window and got ill waiting for the aliens to come back and get me. I wasn't able to belong in Ankara. I was a stranger to Istanbul. I learned how to live without belonging behind four walls, swimming in the pool like a duck, in the boundaries of our tree-filled garden, on the edge of life, joining intentively, step by step, with a void inside me. I get tired of remembering. I want to walk, walk until thoughts and words vanish. Reading myself of words, meaning, languages. I wish I could sentences sentences in the concept and concept in the language and found the basic of conflict and chaos. Mother Nature's arm embarrasses you and she whispers in my ear, I am with you, the time has come. I gifted you to the magic of words, use them. Do the best you can, be open. Despite all the evil and the ruthless, be open you. Be as open with people as you are with nature. Don't be afraid of getting hurt, being judged, not being understood. Mother Nature is with you, so throw down your armor. If you don't want war, stop worrying with yourself. When you were little, you need shields to protect you, but not anymore. If you want to feel love and belonging fully, drop your shields. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maltem, and thank you, Kaya. I'm just getting my own breath back, I think. Um, we've got about seven minutes. Um, so I just really wanted to invite you both, um, we could start with Kaya, because Maltem was just read, to share any more reflections or thoughts that have come out to you for the, from the process of reading. Um, and I'm going to also throw in one more question from the Q&A because I think we've touched on this, but Kaya, I'd particularly, having heard your book, from your book, I'd particularly like to ask you about it. One of our attendees has asked, do you struggle with self-censorship and are there stories you have avoided telling because you were afraid? Afraid is of course a very strong word there, but Kaya, particularly given the way that you talked about questioning your future, um, and you know that challenges to whether or not to become the nightingale, um, and to or to go into exile and or to leave and to move. I wanted to throw that yeah. question to you as well. Well, I, I noticed how uh, pessimist I how pessimistic I was when the two thousand seventeen mm. arrived, and I think uh, in terms of self censorship, um, I think it 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 affects uh, the tone of your. Uh, writing 
you know, maybe uh, the register of your sentences and some of the adjectives even you use, some of the, um, the grammatical uh, formulations you, you come up with. And so I think that uh, in Turkish, we say, you know, you, you make the, uh, the, the word go around. Uh, so you just circle around a certain, um, a certain thing you want to say, but then you like, you make the word go around it and you make, you want the reader to guess what <laughs> you are trying to say. And so this is what happened to most people writing in Turkish. So because I've been writing in English for the past decade, you know, last su summer I celebrated my 10 year, 10 years in writing because I started writing in English for index. That was my first home. So okay. 10 years of index. And then um, I, I noticed that that gave me uh, a great amount of liberty. And also in fiction writers, uh, in poets, uh, my, my friends, they, they have more liberty. But for Turkish journalists who are writing in Turkish, they're in a, in a more difficult situation because their writings are much more closely followed. And um, a scholar I interviewed uh, for a piece I'm working on, on anti-Semitism in Turkey, I said, you know, do you have any problems about your work uh, in academia? And uh, he said, you know, uh, no one reads my uh, scholarly articles, but uh, they look at my Twitter feed. So if someone puts a screen grab of one of my articles uh, on Twitter, and then I may get into trouble. So we see that the censors in Turkey are very lazy. They, they just uh, want to look at Twitter all day. And if they catch something from there, you know, they can go after you. Um, but uh, luckily I was spared. Of, uh, of their attention. Uh, but I realized that I've spent a decade documenting these instances of censorship and there's so much material, you know, every month uh, there is something to write about. And, uh, you know, insulting the president is a big crime in Turkey and there are 500 cases a month. And just imagine 500 cases uh, a month. Uh, you know, pe people are looking at uh, social media feeds of ordinary citizens and finding out these instances. But, you know, it's an impossible war. You know, you, you cannot impose your will on language. Um, but I think the, the people who got it worse have been the Turkish journalists. And I, I can't, I don't write in Turkish because the newspaper I was writing for Radical had to be closed down. And most of the kind of leftist progressive venues in Turkey have gone bankrupt. And now, uh, sadly, there's an economic crisis in Turkey. Yeah. And the publishing industry came to a standstill. You know, we, we, cannot, uh, we, we cannot put out books anymore because all the expenses are in euros, uh, including copyright and the printing fees. Uh, and, and so now... We are seeing first we saw the effects of I think censorship, oppression, self uh, self censorship, and now we are seeing a, a much wider collapse in Turkey because of the economy, and this is much I think much worse because a, a, at least these fiction writers, these poets, could express themselves in books that went unnoticed by the censor. But now the the the, the printers say we won't print your books because you can't pass. So this yeah. here is a big problem for you. Uh, Melton, I wanted to give you the last word. We've only got a couple of minutes. And I wanted in particular um, to bring the subject as we close back to theatre. So um, if you have any last reflections, but in particular, if you have um, thoughts on why, how theatre itself works as a locus for resistance, you know, what is it about theatre that does or doesn't function as a form of resistance against censorship? Because of course there, you know, there are people who say it's not an effective model. What um, do you think? It's interesting because if you ask me before, I say, I don't think it's effective, but what I experience, especially in me minor, I see it's affected. It's, it's affected uh, people and, um, and it's a way to resistance, I believe, um, because you just put the, uh, different people together. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, but I think uh, we need a different voice to hear some, sometimes to change our perception. And what I believe 
theater give the, the, this voice to, to, to people to hear. Um, so I believe it's help and we need more um, maybe in your face theater piece or we need um, more courageous writer uh, in, in the theater space, how, how I believe. Well, thank you, Melton, and thank you very much to Kaya. Thank you to both of you um, and to everyone who joined us today. I'm afraid it is time to wrap up, um, but just to remind you, um, we're here to celebrate the new edition of the Index on Censorship magazine, which looks in particular about at theatre and censorship. And if you wish to stay informed about Index and about future events, everything we do, uh, please sign up to our newsletter at indexoncensorship.org. I think there is a link in the chat. Um, but really, um, a virtual round of applause, I think, for our speakers. I'm clapping, even if no one else can hear it, um, or at least if I can't hear the rest of you. Um, hope to see you all again.